Welcome to California Wine Institute's Behind the Wines series with our host, Elaine Chacon Brown. And thank you all for taking the time out to be with us today. As we move towards the busiest and most exciting time of the year when the grapes come in for harvest, uh, during the month of August, Elaine will guide conversations with leading figures behind some of California's most seminal wineries to learn how they have changed perceptions of California wine, established unknown regions, and raised standards to build California's profile as one of the world's top wine regions. And they haven't done that in an isolated context. They have been heavily influenced by other great wine regions like Burgundy or Bordeaux. And in turn, they have helped shift viticulture and winemaking practices in those historic areas. So this chapter aims to illustrate how the world has changed California and how California has changed the world. Today, we have the privilege to welcome Jim Clendenin. Before we get started, some housekeeping reminders for everyone. Uh, during the webinar, note that there are two communication methods available to participants that we encourage you to use. There is a chat section as well as a Q&A section. And these are different. The chat section is an informal way for you to communicate with other participants. Just be sure to select everyone in the to field as it can default to panelists only. Then there's the Q&A section. And this is where we'd like you to submit your questions for Elaine and Jim to answer towards the end of the webinar. We will do our best to address your questions, uh, but please know any that are not answered live, uh, we'll try to get answers for you in the summary uh, email that you'll receive following the program. Now I'd like to introduce our host, Elaine. In addition to writing for her own site, Waka Waka Wine Reviews, she serves as the American specialist for JancisRobinson.com and contributes to a long list of respected publications. She contributed to the eighth edition of the World Atlas of Wine, which has won multiple awards very recently, as well as the award-winning fourth edition of the Oxford Companion to Wine. She was named by the International Wine and Spirits Competition and in Italy as one of the world's top five wine communicators of the year for the last two years in a row. And Jim, the winemaker, owner, and mind behind of Oban Clamat in Santa Barbara County, after working a few harvests in California and abroad, including Burgundy, Clendenin decided in 1982, along with Adam Tolmack, to start a winery dedicated to Burgundian varieties. Since 1990, Jim has worked solo at the helm of Oban Clamat, which means a well-exposed vineyard, building the winery's recognition worldwide for classically styled wines made from Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Pinot Blanc, and Pinot Gris. And now, Elaine, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Katie. I want to thank Katie. I want to thank everyone uh, for being here with us today. And um, I've heard that there's a strong contingent viewing from Germany, so I want to give a particular shout out to to you. I've heard that some people did some hard work at making sure that the wines are available to all of you. So, welcome, and um, welcome as always to everyone from around the world. It's it's such an honor to be able to host these conversations with all of you. But Jim. Thank you so much. It's really good to see you, and uh, we really appreciate you making time. I know this is a busy time of year. It is. It is. We're getting ready to pick grapes, and mostly what we're doing is trying to bottle all of uh, the last two years' wines that are ready to bottle now so we can make room for it. So we'll be working straight through from now until uh, I think our first grapes are slated to be some Sonoma Pinot Noir, which will be coming in just around the end of uh, August. Well, and how are things looking there in Santa Maria Valley? You know, we're a little cooler than we have been, even though the last week has been scorchingly hot. It's getting cool again. Looks to me like it's going to be what used to be what we called traditionally a normal harvest, beginning in, in like the first week of September and then progressing from variety to variety. Uh, for a long time, we stopped doing that. In 14 and 15, you might remember, we were picking yeah. in July. Yeah. It was absolutely crazy, but... Um, uh, we're we're gonna gonna I think have a normal year. We have good yields, not great yields. They're kind of spotty, a little bit like 19. But all in all, under the radar because of everything weird that we've had in weather patterns. The quality of, of vintages from 15 until 19 has been very, very, very high on balance. Yeah, which is great. Well, and you something you just quickly referenced. You know, you of course are right there in Santa Barbara County and especially in Santa Maria Valley. But a lot of people don't realize you do actually get fruit from vineyards around the state and have even as far north as Mendocino. But you, as you mentioned, your first fruit this year will come in from Sonoma. Well, you, you know, uh, one of the things, Elaine, that people don't know about me is I have a side 
that is self-indulgent. <laughs> I have a side that is still questing, like I'm a little kid running around yeah. in my uh, diapers. And so if somebody offers me good grapes or a possibility of a joint ventureship, I make a lot of wine. And uh, my, my Russian River project with uh, the Mendelssohn family up in uh, Windsor, in, the, in that area, uh, I've been doing for more than 20 years. And it's really, a, it's an extraordinary project. We try to make wine uh, without adding acidity, without um, chaptalizing, without doing anything to adulterate the uh, product, which means we have to pick relatively on the low alcohol side to get the acidity high enough for me to be excited with. And the project's been very, very, very uh, uh, satisfying to me. Well, that kind of, the, you strike me as someone that has a really nice balance of sort of insatiable curiosity, but an ability to hold your line at the same time. And it's, uh, you know, a lot of people kind of err into one or the other, sort of too much stubbornness or, or, um, or so much curiosity, they only wander. But I think, you know, what you're talking about is this, I think it's helped uh, maintain Avon Clement it, but also your interest seems like. Absolutely. Yeah, which is great. But one of the things I know you wanted to talk about today too is how um, you know people are so curious about how does a winery evolve, how does a winery establish its style, and you actually got started. Um, you know, you fell in love with wine in Europe in the 1970s, and then came back, and it, it still in the 1970s, and started working at Zaka Mesa there in Santa Barbara County. And the thing is, there were very very few wineries in Santa Barbara County at the time just a few uh, winemakers, but that time I understand is, was really quite formative for you and the team that you worked with in, in, a, in establishing your love for wine, but also your understanding of what good wine tasted like and amounted to. Could you tell us about that? I sure can. You know, we always gloss over the original experience in California by making jokes saying that in California, they, they taught me how to turn a pump on. In uh, Australia, they taught me how to build a pump. And then when I went to Burgundy, they taught me I didn't need a pump. And so that was kind of the slow evolution. But in reality, um, the, uh, the period of time at, at Zaka Mesa was pretty magical. We had uh, Bob Lindquist, who uh, started Coupe and now has Lindquist family and, and is my partner out here at uh, uh, Once Upon a Time, Clendenin Lindquist, uh, still on a time. And Adam Tolmack, who uh, was actually, because Adam uh, was a person that was raised in a family that encouraged entrepreneurial behavior patterns. And uh, his mother was a lawyer, father was a doctor. And uh, in my family, my father worked in a corporation. He didn't really want my uh, mother to work. She was a teacher, so she taught us. It helped me out a lot in my life. But um, it was a whole different environment. And Adam wanted to start a company. He believed we could, and we did. And uh, uh, it, it Broke up after nine years, but... Uh, That's how you started Aubon Clement with Adam. With Adam in, yeah. uh, in 82. And he went to work in uh, Europe uh, with me in 81. Uh, and because his French language skills weren't strong, he had to pick grapes. And because uh, mine were stronger, I could uh, uh, hang out in the cellar doing punch downs and drinking wine. It was a, a much better life, I guarantee you, than picking grapes that are, that are growing less than 18 inches off the ground. But we started really drinking fine wine. Ken Brown's with us there too. And he turned me on in 1978 to uh, a great quality of wine that I'd never had before. There's no question about that. Uh, but we were in, we, we ended up doing wine tastings afterwards. We ended up, you know, reading everything we could about open top fermentations, about malolactic fermentations with white wine. And there were all things that weren't being done commercially in California. Every time I bring it up, there's some crusty old codger, even crustier and older and more codger-like than me, who says, well, you're forgetting about Shalone. You're mm -hmm. forgetting about Martin Ray. And I'm not. Uh, and there was no question in my mind that there was a, uh, a, a nascent effort to try to make some of those styles of wine on a very, very, very uh, uh, tiny level and usually in places that were interesting for planning, but not interesting in the long run for Pinot Noir or Chardonnay. And so this was all the, you know, chaotic, you know, laboratory kind of uh, work environment that, that we were part of. And it was something that prepared me then to go down to what I thought were cool climates in Australia. And they weren't mm -hmm. quite as cool as I think Australia needed to have for Pinot you know, Noir and Chardonnay. But uh, we made interesting wines there. There's no question about it. And then when I went to Burgundy, I, I worked for Domaine Duke Magenta in uh, Oxy Duress. And I, and I 
worked with Gerard Patel, the late Gerard Patel, and much missed and much lamented from Pueblo Boot Store. And those people just opened doors in production techniques, in um, styles of wine, you know. I mean, we bounce around a lot in California in styles of wine. Elena, as, as, as you well know, you know, we went through the uh, yeah. food wine things of the, of the late 80s, and then we're all, all of a sudden we're in the uh, uh, Alice wines for about a minute, mm -hmm. and then, then we go to uh, port-like Pinots and uh, sherry-like Chardonnays, and it just, why? I don't know. I don't know. You know, is it just a question of having no rudder? You know, I always thought that when people uh, ran through California, people like, like uh, Raj Barr and, and Jasmine Hirsch, and asked people to join a group that was called In Pursuit of Balance, there were 35 wineries that wanted to be part of that. And in the end, maybe a few more. But the uh, are you guys okay hearing? I've got a little bog. Yeah, no, it's okay. Yeah, the wine. sounds okay. fine. Good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you bet. So um, I think that, that um, if you drove through Burgundy and you had a loudspeaker on top of your car and you asked in 50 different villages, does anybody want to join in pursuit of imbalance? <laughs> Nobody would say yes. <laughs> and uh, and so how we got in those situations were bouncing back and forth like a pendulum on a huge level of stylistic change. Uh, I don't know, but I'm uh, I'm just guessing. We we were never a wine culture. We're barely a wine culture now. But where we've come in production and in consumption in America over the last thirty years has been absolutely extraordinary. Quality of wines made here quality of wines that we can deliver to people in a style that makes sense and in a style that is increasingly less and less available in the world. Burgundy is not getting any bigger and the number of wealthy clients for Burgundy from China, from Brazil, from India has uh, increased exponentially. Well, I, you know, I, I have to say though that you, the work that you've done has had a profoundly positive effect in California. And you know, you're talking about how California is, changed style so many times, but there's a way in which you have really had a clarity, clarity of vision to a large extent with Avon Clement from the beginning and really have helped maintain that style. And the truth is that, um, you know, for, forgive me for saying this to you directly, but, you know, I think you, you truly are one of the most important and influential winemakers in California, but um, because of that clarity of vision, but also because you really have worked to foster newer, younger winemakers and the, the sense of community you've created through your winery there and helping to kind of mentor people and, but also create a sort of familial winemaking community has had a profound effect on California wine and has really helped build Santa Barbara County as a wine, as a true wine destination now as well. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you saying that. We've been sort of uh, getting ready for international attention, respect, response, recognition now for uh, over 30 years. So I'm bound and determined <laughs> one day to be an overnight success. Right. <laughs> then everybody's going to recognize it. In the last couple of years, I have to tell you, there's been more recognition in the aftermath of In Pursuit of Balance, where people recognize the style, want the style, and appreciate our contribution to the style, there's been far, far, far more uh, respect and attention to the style of wines we're making than we had in the past. Obviously, in the late um, 80s, when nobody cared about super high octane wines, we were sort of a top 10 most interesting wineries program in the Wine Advocate. We, uh, you know, got a lot of attention from the James Hallidays of the world, the Matt Kramers of the world. We, we, we were really doing well for the tiny little little amount of wine that we made. And then for a long period of time, as the company kept growing, as we had, we had fans, we had people who appreciated the style of wine that we made. For a long period of time, the, um, we, we, the, 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 the sun didn't shine on me. The sun, the sun didn't care. Yeah, you were out of didn't favor, care. out of trend. You yeah. we were very much out of favor. And, uh, and you know, it's, uh, it's a difficult thing to, to battle. But at no point did I ever want to change wholesale the style of a bon climat. Instead, we got more and more and more refined with what we did. And every different department of what we could work with to make the quality of the product that we were, we were making higher uh, was um, 
from the bottles that we use to make sure that there's no vibration or light shining through them mm -hmm. to, to the mm -hmm. corks that we use, which we, uh, we spent so much money on finding the best corks we could find. And we've been lucky with corks. We've never been devastated uh, the way a lot of California wineries were in the late 1980s and stuff. And, and then the uh, grapes that we replanted. And now uh, I'm working with two vineyards that are still almost 50 years old. Mm -hmm. in the and Sanford and Benedict with the original plantings that they had there, which is an extraordinary thing because I don't, I disdain many old vines because the people that planted them had the wrong density yeah. and the wrong yeah. orientation. They didn't understand on any level what was good. So how could they be better after 50 years? They're just older. But we have those two vineyards, which are extraordinary. Vienna Cito, absolutely extraordinary. Sanford and Benedict, the best piece of dirt that I've ever seen to plant anywhere in the world. I planted my own vineyards and, and my own vineyards, and uh, all, all of the things that I replanted at the Indecido and that I planted at Le Bon Clima, uh, and the majority of things at, uh, at Rancho Lacuna are now 20 years or older. And so it's just giving me a really sweet spot right now to make yeah. the style of wines that I want. And I understand fully the style of wines that I want to make. I'll tell you just one really quick thing in the style evolution thing. Um, there were a lot of critics that liked bigger wines that I was making. There were a lot of critics that didn't like acidity. There were a lot of critics that um, couldn't understand my attitude, my lack of uh, grooming, and my uh, big freaking mouth. And so we, we ended up, you know, butting heads with a lot of people. Uh, but one of the guys we didn't butt heads with was Dan Berger. And Dan Berger was writing for the LA Times at that time. Dan was um, – a really bright guy and he loved sports. He was writing about sports before he was writing about wine. I love sports. So he and I talked a lot about sports. And uh, finally one day in 1992, he named me winemaker of the year for the LA Times. And we'd never had anybody from the Central Coast that even made the top 10 or 15 or 20 or 25. And he said, look, I don't like the Obon Clima wines. They're not my style of wine. They're too earthy. They're too spicy. They're too complex. They aren't open, rich, generous enough. But if anybody wants to make that style of wine, I would only trust one person to make that style of wine. And he, he said he knew that I knew what I was doing. This is what I wanted to do. And so he gave me recognition for that. And, you know, how many people are open-minded like yeah, that? I mean, yeah. Circumstances go around like that. Yeah. No, I've gotten to travel, actually, with Dan and do a lot of tastings with him. And he's somebody that I try to really – respectfully listen to because he's got such a history of knowledge with the state but also with global wine um <laughs> we have a visitor um so let's go ahead and look though at where where we're talking about in the world because sometimes um internationally and even here in california people can get confused about where santa maria valley is so let's go ahead and look at some maps just briefly um so people know the region of the world we're looking at this is of course a big map of California. It shows all of California. And you can see uh, Katie has done the work of highlighting the area we're focused in on that black box there, centers Santa Barbara County. And then if we zoom in to the next map, this helps us see Santa Barbara County as a whole. You were talking about Sanford and Benedict Vineyard. It's there at the bottom part of Santa Rita Hills, um, which is in the San Yanez Valley and close to the town of Lompoc. But we're actually, um, speaking today mainly about the northern part of Santa Barbara County, which is their Santa Maria Valley near the town of Santa Maria. And it's actually one of the most agriculturally diverse um, regions, certainly in the state, but also in North America and even in the world. There's incredible uh, range of agricultural crops and, and even um, avocado plantings. And, um, but f importantly there, you can see it's uh, relatively close to the ocean. And Santa Barbara County, but Santa Maria Valley, especially if you focus in closely on this map, you can see the mountain texture there. And what it's important to notice is that the Santa Maria Valley is a river valley and it does have hills and mountains on either side, but in on the north and the south. And what that means is the Santa Maria Valley is fully exposed to the influence of the ocean. And the ocean current there in the Pacific off the coast of Santa Barbara is actually one of the coldest ocean currents in the world. And so this region actually gets um, daily, very cold maritime fog. It also gets a daily cool afternoon wind. And 
what that means is we actually are talking about in Santa Maria Valley, one of the longest, slowest, coolest growing seasons in North America. Um, and so the, the grape ripening happens over a very long, slow period of time through the year. And if we focus in to the next map, which is just Santa Maria Valley, we can see here Bien Nacido and your vineyard Le Bon Clement on either side of the Sisquoc River, which forms the Santa Maria River Valley. But you can catch a glimpse here again of um, there's no mountain barricade between Santa Maria Valley and the ocean. And so that it's very much uh, informed by the maritime influence. But as you were saying, this has been one of the colder years. And so the, um, the, the season's been incredibly long and slow. And if we could go to the photo that, that you sent, Jim, of Bien Nacido Vineyard, this is really nicely um, situated uh, shot. You can see the vineyards planted on the benchland there and that fog really hugged in, staying late into the morning and, and really making diffuse light over the vines. Is there anything else you'd like to add about kind of the character of the region? Well, you know, to put it in the, in the things that people can easily understand, our uh, vineyards start pushing their buds out between four and six weeks earlier than Sonoma and, and Napa then um, e even the protected from the mountain areas, Paso Robles and, uh, and stuff. And, and, you know, getting that extra month of hang time when things are quite cool. And then, of course, when the fog comes in in, in uh, June and July, then our average temperature during those two months is about 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, which and is incredibly cold. Incredibly cold. Up, up in the North Coast, uh, it, it's often during that period of time in the, in the 80s. When we get into August and September, uh, we finally get into the 80s, which is a nice thing, and uh, mostly in the 70s, but we get into the 80s. But when we're getting into the 80s, other people are getting into the hundreds in Northern California. And then at nighttime, um, even, even if we get up into 78, 82, 85, then, then we drop back down into the 50s. And that temperature swing keeps our acidity. And I mean, all you have to do is taste the wines. Yeah. And uh, starting when I replanted my vineyards in 2001, uh, it was the first time I started getting five, six, seven-year-old uh, grapes uh, to, to work with. And it was the first time uh, in 2001 I didn't have to add acid to any wine that I made. It didn't matter what the grape was, nothing that I made. And I thought, boy, this augurs well for the future. And it certainly has. Well, so let's start looking at the wines. You know, we're, so we're starting with Chardonnay. And the, you know, what you were describing, the, in Santa Maria Valley and Santa Barbara County in general, but especially Santa Maria Valley, Acidity levels are naturally incredibly high. It preserves a lot of freshness. But my tasting experience too is that that growing season is long and slow and that creates this kind of amazing flavor concentration, flavor density. Without having to have a bigger wine, you just, you have a lot of kind of intensity of flavor and also like a sense of deeper savory tones, but then really elevated acidity at the same time. And I love that kind of counterbalance of high tone acid and then deep tone flavor. Uh, I, I do too. And I think that's the, uh, the deep tone flavor comes from the extra month uh -huh. of the vines before we pick. So the slower, um, the, the, the uh, uh, more calm uh, ripening period allows the foundation to be much stronger in the wine. And then for me, um, when we get in a position that we can actually have the things happen that I'm looking forward to, malolactic fermentation happening in barrel fermentation happening in barrel and we're in a situation where uh, we, we have only the amount of alcohol we're producing that we need 12 8 to 13 2 then the wines go dry if we have the right yeast that's involved in the fermentation uh, we still with white wines inoculate for malolactic fermentation and make sure they go through because i don't want oxidation in my wines on any right. level I want right. them to be really 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 tight when they come out but i think that again means that our fermentation goes from a uh, two-week period of time max to a six-week, seven-week period of time uh, to get it to go through a malolactic. And, you know, we bring the grapes in in September, uh, especially the whites, these, these two whites, in September, mm -hmm. and the malolactic's finished uh, right before Christmas. And so they're working that whole time, and when they do that, they're extracting things during the fermentation that have a level of texture, a level of flavor, a level of depth, even a little bit of a uh, level of reductivity, which for years and years and years in Burgundy was called a Burgundian slate minerality. Mm -hmm. and I'm saying 
nearly Burgundian slate minerality. Really, a little bit of stink, but I like a little bit of stink. It's uh, well, it's only I've been a, it's, our wine in barrel for a very long time. Our wines are in barrel for uh, up to two years, sometimes a little bit longer, and that growth stimulates better texture, better depth, better richness, and with, with without using the alcohol. I mean, what you get when you harvest is one thing. What you get when you uh, harvest properly and are patient is an entirely different thing. Well, and you're also, I mean, you, like you said, you're barrel fermenting, you're going through malolactic in barrel. And the truth is you're also not afraid of new oak. There's a lot of prejudice against new oak in Chardonnay, but your, your wines are such a testament to how vines in the right place um, actually marry to oak so beautifully. And, and, you know, especially with the, the kind of acid that we're talking about and the depth of flavor that we're talking about, there's a way in which the way that you're using oak just sort of kind of rounds the layers a little bit. Um, and, and there's so much drive, you know, so the first wine that we're talking about is the 2016, but then we're also looking at how, how that same wine ages and, and looking at the 2002 at the same time. And there's just so much drive and depth at the same time. Can you speak to, just speak to that, you know, again, you have experience working with Chardonnay in multiple regions of the world and obviously have committed to Santa Barbara County. But, um, you know, we're, you know, you we're joking about this idea of balance, but oak really plays an important part of that balance in, in a wine like uh, your Nuit Blanche. Could you speak to that a little bit? I can um, the first thing I did when I went to Burgundy in 1981 was uh, wait and wait and wait during a rainy three-week period of time for the grapes to ripen. 81 was not a year, if you're born in that year, I apologize in advance for saying this, but not a year you wanted to buy a bunch of Burgundy and put it away in your cellar to drink it when you were 21 years of age because uh, by that time the stuff was pretty diffuse and uh, broken down. The... Um, job that I had when I was waiting for the grapes to get ripe was uh, uh, riding in a truck with Jean-Francois, Francois Frere in Burgundy, and meeting his customers. You know, when you got a customer list like Maine La Romani Conti, 100% of the barrels provided to them, Henri Jaillet, Armand Rousseau, you know, you've got just the creme de la creme, and then small producers too, who were just looking for the best barrels that they could get. And so I got a chance to meet all these people and, uh, and learn a lot about barrels. And so when I found out that Romani Conti worked with barrels uh, in a different way than anybody else. Instead of 18 months air dried by the Francois Frere company, they bought the wood in advance, picking the sites they wanted. So nothing was homogenized or blended, different kinds of wood put together for a barrel. They got them from the forest that they wanted. And then they uh, had a heavy toast put on them and they let them dry in the, in the elements for, uh, or they let them dry in the elements for three years instead of 18 months. And then they put the heavy toast on them and, and made the barrels. And so, uh, I immediately went home and bought my wood first, aged it, and did the same thing. So by 1985, we were using three-year air-dried wood, and it really changed the quality of the wines that we had in a big way. I now have a new type of barrel I'm working with that I learned about from Pierre-Yves Collin. That, that is 350-liter uh, barrels bigger and 100% mm -hmm. new, and uh, they, they make the wines a little tighter, a little tauter, a little bit more reductive. And uh, since 2015, all of our top quality cuvées of, uh, of Chardonnay are, are all made from an age in those barrels. We're now moving a little bit of our Pinot Noir production into that too for, for, for special stuff. But that wood, once you have it, it's unmistakable. You know, when you go to Burgundy, every place is the same. If it's a Grand Cru, you've got between 50 and 100% new wood in it. If it's a Premier Cru, you've got from 25 to 50% new wood in it. If it's a village wine, usually nothing, unless there's something declassified later on. I make wine from 2250 to 60 in Chardonnay, and I guarantee you that the $60 wines are 100% in new wood, the best wood on earth, the best grapes I can access, and they're the best wines we make far and away. And then we have other wines that are 25 to uh, $35, and, and, and those are 18 to... 20 months in 25 to 50% new wood. And why? Because new wood costs more money. So right. I find it very convenient when things changed and, and there were uh, critical uh, disapprovals over new wood. And so people stopped buying it. They saved themselves a fortune and lowered their prices. 
at all. <laughs> but uh, but there you are. But in my case, um, I, I think we've solved the wood problem. I think we get the best barrels on earth from Francois Freire. I think we've uh, uh, done very well in court. You know? And now we have uh, only a couple places to conquer. And one of them is grapes. Mm -hmm. And we're working really hard on that too. And I think my staff, Jim Edelman, my general manager, uh, Enrique Rodriguez, our seller master who's worked with me since 1988, and Arturo Alvarez, who handles, the, runs the directs the bottling that we do and really is an overall, just a massive quality control contributor to what we're doing. Um, I, I think we've got our production staff in a phenomenal position. And they've always gotten me as the mind behind if they need to call on me. Right. Well, let's go ahead and, you know, one of the things that you wanted us to do is show a photo of your team because, um, and so let's go ahead and do that because as you're pointing out, you know, wine, you know, you, you really are, um, you know, well-known, well-established, legendary winemaker in California. But, but as you're pointing out, it's really a team that makes the wine. And, and so, and that's one of the things that I really admire and respect about you is you you do always celebrate your team and make sure people know that. And, and um, so this is a photo of the seller team, essentially. So Jim Edelman, Enrique, and then, um, forgive me to the, the, um, the fourth person and, here. On the, far, on the far left is Arturo Alvarez. Yeah, and he's the newest member of, of the seller team. Only been uh, with us for slightly less than 22 years. Uh, yeah, <laughs> as the newest member. So, the, you know, this is a team that together um, are making the wine. And, you know, tasting this 2002, the thing that strikes me is that there, that acid drive is still absolutely present. The integration of the different elements is really beautiful. There's a way in which the texture gets more silky over time. But the big thing that stands out to me with your Chardonnays and aging is that that savory element becomes more prominent. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I just, I drank your 2001 um, Nuit Blanche this weekend, actually, and in anticipation of this seminar. And now we're talking about the 2002, but the, you know, so these are 18 and 19 year old Chardonnays. A lot of people really don't think of California or, or of Chardonnay in general as producing an ageable wine. But the, you know, this 2002 is such a gorgeous example. There's so much time left in bottle that it could have, but that again, what I see with your, your Chardonnay as it ages, it be, the texture becomes a little more silky and the flavors become a little more savory, but that acid line really maintains. Yeah, no, I, 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 uh, I agree. You know, I think that, um, it was disappointing for me uh, when, when I went to work in Burgundy, when I first visited in Burgundy in, in 77, but I went to work there in 81, I drank so many old wines and everybody celebrated the wines that their grandparents made for God's sake, let alone that their parents made. And the wines were absolutely extraordinary. I had the pleasure of tasting a lot of Dominique Lafon's wines from really crappy vintages supervised by his father, uh, 63, 65, 68, you know, years you want to run away from screaming from 90% of the producers. And it was just amazing. 15 years later, I had a bottle of the 63 Morgache with uh, Jasper Morris in London. Just extraordinary. And when you have those experiences, and right now, my, my uh, back of my neck is tingling just, you know, thinking about those experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, it changes what you want to do with the wines that you're drinking. And so uh, I learned to love older wines, and I still love older wines, and I kept a library large enough that I can share older wines. We're selling a few older wines now because it's about that time. But every day at lunch, we'll have people that uh, don't know our products really well when we're open. We're not open right now because of coronavirus. Right. I want you to know, and it, it's a real, uh, it's a nightmare to be spending a year of the last years of your life uh, <laughs> trapped in your own home. It's your own company, good Christ, in a schizophrenic sense. I wish I was a better person. <laughs> It's yeah, no, I mean, I, it's a weird challenging time for all of us, but, um, the, but I mean, the, the lunches that you host and the wines that you open, it's a really special opportunity when, when people are able to visit and, and are able to be there in Santa Barbara County. It's really pretty incredible to taste your, your older vintages, but the 2002 is actually something you've made available again now. I found, I found a bunch of, and so my tasting room down in Santa Barbara will have some of that if anybody contacts them. It's hard to ship wine to Germany. It's hard to ship wine to uh, uh, Europe, hard to ship wine in some states in America. So it's a bit complicated. 
but the reality is that um, uh, those wines can can be gotten. The, the 2001 in Magnum, the same thing. You know, when uh, did you come down with all the MWs? Yeah, uh -huh. our, yeah, that was a great day. Uh, we had a chance to cook for them, which was fun. Me and Enrique headed the team with Doreen, who worked with us, and um, we put out uh, lunch for 100 people, and we served almost 20 year old Chardonnay all of them and uh it's something not too many people in california can do and you know sometimes even i forget that that um i maintain a library because i worked in burgundy and i saw the libraries that the burgundians kept and that's how they could pull out old bottles to share with me and uh now if you go to my my library it's a five thousand square foot building that is 35 feet tall and full packed with uh with bottles and organized by arturo and so now we can actually access them and go on with that. But I truly believe uh, there are a lot of people that have ideas about what makes a great wine. Some bring it down to yeast, some bring it down to whatever. But uh, in reality, for me, if a bottle is not doesn't have longevity, it's not a great one. And um, that's just my thinking. And it's not right. maybe anybody else's. You know, uh, it's so much fun when you meet people that have given their life up to building wine collections. And then when you see the ones that are selling them all because they've gotten more value than drinking them, you got to feel sorry for them a little bit because they've held them for a long time and then they got money in their pocket. And I'm going to say, I get less satisfaction from gold and from dollars and stock shares than I do from drinking a great bottle of wine. And I think everybody listening to this webinar should understand the benefit of picking the right bottles that can mature and then being patient with some. Mm -hmm. Don't be patient with all of them. Just keep a couple of bottles and see whether after 10 years you like them more Whether after 20 years you like them more and if you don't then um stop doing it <laughs> that's true no because it really it's a matter of taste as well but let's be sure to talk about pinot as well and we um so we're looking at the isabel and it's uh we have two vintages here of your isabel pinot the 2016 and the 2008 and when you started making this wine, it was unique for you in that it's a blend of vineyards. And, um, and my understanding is predominantly Biendecido, but this actually can be a blend of up to six other vineyards and, and really not only in Santa Barbara County, but other parts of the Central Coast and even other parts of California sometimes. Is that right? It is. When my daughter was born, uh, I was 42 years of age. Uh, I was thrilled by having my first child with, with Morgan Clendenin. And the uh, change that went through me, uh, I used to write newsletters uh, every, every release and did all kinds of stuff like that. And when I had a baby girl, I had a baby girl in my hands. I traveled a lot still, but uh, I, I stopped doing a lot of things that I did, and I wanted to do some things differently and better. So I came up with the idea of taking the best barrels of the best things that we harvest in the winery and blending them 100% new oak. We always put every potentially good site into uh, new wood. And then we evaluate it after a year, we evaluate it again after two years and we decide what's going to go into the bottling. And after that we fine it, we don't filter it. And that's all that we have. Uh, various times I've had Mendocino fruit there from a wonderful vineyard owned by a very famous San Francisco lawyer. And I, I've had the uh, Russian River Project that I'm involved with. And I'll tell you that uh, besides one section of the Indecito, the largest amount of wine that goes into my Isabel is uh, Barra Mendelssohn now from the Lollaponzi Vineyard up in the Russian River. Because uh, it's just perfect. And, you know, I don't know why people didn't blend at the highest level. Why do people blend at the lowest level? Why do people take all their mediocre little things and put them together and call it county wine, call it whatever. I mean, that's okay, but really easy to do. But to do something where you have an opportunity to make a complex wine, a multi-dimensional wine, a wine that is consistently great every year by taking your best barrels and blending at the top end, <coughs> I think that could be the answer for a lot of things that are going on in California now. I see mm -hmm. a lot of four-year-old vineyards, first harvest, picked by winemakers who are rookies, and they're trying to sell the wine for a hundred bucks because it's a very expensive vineyard planted near a very, very important place in Sonoma or a very important place in Napa or a very important place close to Sanford and Benedict in the new Star Rita Hills. And frankly, young vine, single vineyard, 
first shot at it line isn't the answer for high quality. Well, yeah, it doesn't have the complexity, but the, the, I mean, I think with Pinot, there's such a, there's a sort of cultural attachment to single vineyard meaning best, as, but especially with Pinot Noir. And um, the Isabel is such a testament to the real, there's this tooth, I mean, the aging, <laughs> the ageability on this wine is really quite remarkable because the 2008, it's, there's so much detail. There really is so much detail in this wine. And I think with aging wine, uh, it's easy to assume the detail is going to kind of smudge away as if the boundaries melt a little bit as a wine ages. But there's actually still a remarkable sense of precise tannin, you know, fine but lightly textured precise tannin and really incredible detail of flavor. And, um, and then again, that acid drive that we talked about with the Chardonnay is very much here in the Pinot as well. So to know that it's not only a vineyard blend, but a multi-regional blend is really kind of fascinating because I think we, um, there's again, you know, there's an assumption that with something like Pinot Noir, oh, single vineyard wines are the best wines. But there's also a lot of prejudice against the idea of different regions being blended. But this is such, this wine and what you're talking about, it's such an example of how actually when you sort of let go of those assumptions, the possibilities of what you can create in terms of completeness and complexity is really pretty remarkable. You know, all over, all over the globe, you know, uh, Martin Kussler, my importer in Germany, who organized our, our German contingent and European contingent who were with us, has always been a supporter of Isabel. And uh, it's when we show it to people, they gravitate to it. Uh, Isabel is a Pinot Noir that um, myself and Jim Edelman in particular are working with. Isabel herself is now coming to taste with us so she can learn as much as she can. Mm -hmm. But the uh, choices that we make to be emblematic of what the vintage offers, that's pretty rare. You know, we could always try to make a big dark one and we could always try to make a light elegant one. We try to offer what the vintage offers. And then the things that we choose are based around purity of fruit, complexity, earthiness and all those things really add together the synergy of making the wine into a much more complex, much more interesting product. Um, your uh, colleague, Chances Robinson, is an early adherent to, uh, to this wine, very early. Mm -hmm. And this 2008 was her favorite wine in the tasting of, four, it started with 400 German Pinot Noirs, then they tasted them down to 40 Germans went in, 10 or 20 Californians, 10 or 20 Burgundies, 10 or 20 from other places in, in Europe. And this was her top line of that tasting. And uh, it wasn't the one that won the tasting overall. That was a great wine made, made in Oregon. But um, it was really interesting to me to see that because at that point we'd had the 05, we'd had the 06, we had the um, 90, one of the early four or five or sixes and then, and then the uh, 99 that um, the wine magazine she contributes to gave five stars to. Mm -hmm. And nobody in California and wine had had more than one five-star reading for any, any given wine that they made. And so clearly we struck something in consistency and in accessibility and in understanding that appealed to a very serious clientele of critics and tasters. Well, the 2008, like, again, it just really strikes me as I, um, I get little hints that it's, there's a few years on it. You know, there's a little, there's little indications of, of it having been in bottle for a little bit, but it's actually a 12 year old wine. And so the idea that it's not standing out to me as an aged Pinot, I'm just getting hints that there's some, there's some age on it. And again, if I was blinded on this, I would guess a few years, not 12 years, you know, it, again, it just really speaks to the ageability of these wines. Cause this, I mean, this easily a, another decade and far, far, far more that it has for aging potential in the bottle. And for Pinot, I, again, Chardonnay and Pinot people tend to think of as delicate. Oh, we should, you know, a lot of winemakers in California I've interviewed, they'll say, Oh, you know, seven years on a Pinot is, is good. And here we're far over 12 and it feels like it's only aged a couple of years. You know, it's, it, it's really 
pretty remarkable. You know, it's just the way we make wine. There's no question. I, um, I, I use a seven-year analogy too, and I only use it because in seven, within seven years from the vintage date that's on the bottle, the, uh, our Pinot Noirs in the New World begin to show what they have. Right, right, right. But it doesn't mean to show what they could have. And so we did not very long ago a, a uh, comprehensive tasting of Isabel coming from the year of her inception all the way to the 17, which hadn't been released and still hasn't been released. And so we went from uh, 90, 94 to 17, and th there wasn't an awkward bottle amongst them, things that we never thought would be showing great. One of the clumsiest wines we ever made was the 96, you know, hard, cool vintage, lots mm -hmm. of acidity. And that was probably, um, if I was honest, probably the best wine of the tasting. But uh, the 94 and 95 are where I'm emotionally, the conception and the birth year are mm -hmm. the two places that I'm inextricably bound in my love for my daughter. And so right. and those, those got better, uh, better attention for me. And then the 99 was truly extraordinary. And I mean, it's, it's a, uh, I mean, it's a really fun project. I make one for my son too. Don't think that I'm, uh, debunking him and, and he's going to hate the Knox. Yeah. The Knox Alexander. And uh, that's all made from high elevation vineyards that I planted, uh, Bienecito North facing a thousand foot elevation with really interesting clones. So that's, that's fun too. It's been a great thing. Very different wines. Isabel's always precious and forward and, and, um, elegant and Knox's wines are, are pretty young manly. Mm -hmm. But I want to point out, though, like, they're elegant with incredible strength and detail. You know, the sometimes people will assume when we call a wine elegant, we there's almost uh, a misunderstanding. Thin, thin, that thin and weedy? Yeah, and this because is... You're, no, interesting is a code word for messed up. <laughs> elegant is not a co code word for messed up. What I've told <laughs> no, everybody it's is, beautiful. I want, to, what I want to get to this. Elaine, only because I have to tell it all the time. Yeah. What can't you rank, rate, or take a picture of? Breed, elegance. Why, when you go to France for the first time and you taste, in, in red wines in particular, you taste the greatest vineyards, and yet the wines aren't as big as, you know, the most powerful village, uh, Gevry Chambertin, or Nuit Saint-Georges. When you're tasting Von Romanet Grand Cruz, they aren't nearly as powerful. What are they? Elegant, Great, they yeah. breed, they have yeah. nuance. And you know, when I came home preaching elegance, breed, and nuance, people just said, get another job, you're a boob, because they don't want to see that. They want to see power. They want to see intensity. They want to see um, drive. They don't want to see the things that really are transparently revealing a quality of vineyard that can't be duplicated. Well, and so something I want to make sure and highlight that's kind of been implied but not said directly is so we're tasting 2016 as the first vintage on both Chardonnay and Pinot and that's the, the that is the current release you know and so and I think that really I want to make sure and emphasize that because it really speaks again to this idea of ageability and the sort of natural condition of the vineyards that you work with and the wine that you make that again it has that natural acidity it, um, the wines like to age in cellar and then in bottle and, and um, do very well with that. And um, somebody's asking about, um, you know, how do you know if a wine, especially a Pinot is gonna go the distance? In my mind, again, that, that kind of harmony and elegance that we're talking about plays a big role. If there's a sense of kind of a natural density without heaviness, that implies that there's something to uncurl over time you know, the, the natural acid profile on a wine says a lot about the aging potential. Are there other things you would um, add that imply to you a wine has the potential to age? If you, you know, experience, history, and reputation. If uh, uh, you taste for the first time my 16 and don't think it's going to age, uh, it'd be nice to have a wine merchant, nice to have a, a critic that you believed in, nice to have somebody to say, oh, uh, we've had 25 vintages of that already, and yeah. you know, they're, they're fantastic. And that's one of the ways you, you know. I mean, I had to work out my favorite winemakers, whether I thought their wines were better after 15 years. Uh, and there were a couple that I did. Uh, one of the most famous, le legendary is Henri Jaillet. His wines were glorious at five years, glorious at 10 years, glorious at 15 years. And then the fruit just you know, couldn't stand up to the arriving complexity. And it changed the wines. You know? 
And then the flip side of that is ZRC, where the wines can be hard and tight when they're uh, 10 years old. And then when you have them at 25 years old, they're absolutely yeah, glorious. Yeah, suddenly they're and they need They need a little bit more to transform them. I don't think our, these wines, the Isabel's, transform, uh, but I do think they become much more complex and delicious over time. And, you know, once again, this time thing, when you and I were talking about it, it was a very difficult thing for me to talk about. But I talk about you, the consumer, spending your money to buy my wine, and then you have to keep it before you drink it. <laughs> That's a con job. <laughs> you, know? you don't think it's yeah. great now? You don't think it's perfect? Put it away for 25 years. It'll be fabulous. I'll be dead. I don't care. Well, but the thing I want to point out, though, is you've not changed your prices. You know, if people, um, you know, can take a look back at the recording of this episode later and they'll see, you know, the the Chardonnay in 2002 was the same price that the Chardonnay now in 2016 is. You know, that's actually pretty unusual as well. And it says a lot about your commitment to the consumer, actually, that you're keeping. You know, our, our, our costs don't change that much. You know, I mean, it's easier now. Because our vineyards are more mature, we have more control of them. Uh, barrels have gone up a lot in cost. That's a little bit of a problem. But uh, it's, you know, wine pricing is such a funny, funny thing. And uh, I've often told people that at some point it became apparent to me that in a past life I had to be Genghis Khan or uh, Vlad the Impaler or uh, a, a progenitor of the coronavirus because – I've had to do a lot of charity work and a lot of, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, to make up. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I want to make sure we have um, time to talk about Nebbiolo and we only have a little bit more time left, but something, you know, you're so um, associated with Pinot Noir and Chardonnay that a lot of people don't realize you've actually really devoted um, a lot of your career and a lot of time and vineyard space to Italian varieties. And in fact, I think have, have really, um, California is not super associated with Italian varieties, but I, I really believe that your Clendenin family wines show how beautiful they can be. And, and in my mind, your Nebbiolo really is the standout star for, for California and that variety. But you also, I mean, you know, in making it, again, the current release that we're talking about is the 2011, is your current release, Punta Exclamativa Nebbiolo. And you spent have spent a lot of time looking to the home of Nebbiolo in Italy and and not only Barolo and Barbaresco but also Gattanara and and have spent a lot of time learning from your friends there but also investing in what you see is the best clonal material that California has and this um particular wine is entirely maquette if I remember correctly uh, which is right. the clonal material of Nebbiolo but can you speak to kind of how you know so this from what I recall, the 2011's aged six years in barrel and then an additional year in bottle, which again, that's a remarkable investment on your part, but really speaks to your dedication to do what you, to what you think is right by the wine. But again, you, you spent a lot of time learning from your friends there in Italy in order to then translate that to, to your wines here in California. Could you speak to that connection and, and how and also your connection to Nebbiolo itself? I can. So I started making Nebbiolo in 1986 mm -hmm. with Bruno D'Alfonso. We had a local grower who grew some grapes and uh, gave them to Bruno and Bruno didn't have a lot of experience with uh, Nebbiolo and didn't uh, end up falling in love with it uh, the way I did. So we made the wine together. He ended up giving it to me because he didn't like the way it turned out. And I started making multi vintage blends mm -hmm. over time because the, uh, uh, the 86 wasn't good but certainly the 88 89 and 90 were uh, were excellent and i did all kinds of experiments with uh, aging the more i learned in italy when somebody said we aged it four years or five years or six years the more i wanted to experiment with those things and i just love nebbiolo i think the two grapes that are most linked and i'm going to give you a third one in a second uh are, are pinot noir and nebbiolo and back in the mid mid to late 80s i started going to in italy Martin Kussler, who's on this uh, webinar with us, uh, went with me probably six or eight vintages out of 10 there. And uh, he was totally well-connected with Italian winemakers. And uh, I became well-connected too, and just had a phenomenal time there. Learned more about, before I started my Italian projects, I learned more about Italian varieties 
that I ever learned about Burgundian varieties because I didn't have that much time. But I had I had that much time. We at one point got up to 14 varieties. I was competing with myself. It was an asinine way to try to make a living. Luckily, I had a Bontima that was paying the bills. But um, I, I, I just took Ifrialano. It's what I'm making white now only, and it's a beautiful wine. Yeah, the no, Nebbiolo. Yeah, the Nebbiolo is a beautiful wine. Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, Pinot Blanc, Pinot Gris, Aligoté. I'm doing a ton of Aligoté now, and uh, I'm having fun with it because people have finally discovered when it's easier for them to buy a bottle of Aligoté that's delicious in Burgundy right now than to buy a bottle of, uh, of a Grand Cru, uh, it's become quite popular. And uh, so I've really expanded my Aligoté production. Anybody can buy it now. It's really delicious wine. Uh, and then the other thing I'm really interested in now is um, Grenache. I'm interested in Grenache for 25, 30 years. I've been drinking Chateau Reyes. Chateau Reyes to me is one of the most complex Pinot Noirs of the world. And it's made of 100% This Grenache. happens to be made of Grenache, yeah. And so I'm, oh, I'm using 100% whole cluster with my Grenache. I'm keeping it three years in barrel the way that uh, uh, Jacques Reynaud of, uh, of uh, Reyes did when I went over to visit him. He was a wonderful guy. He had a lot of patience with me. During that period of time, I was particularly unkempt in my personal appearance. And so I always uh, thought maybe that my friend Didier Dagano wanted to go visit him too. And so D Didier went to visit him. And uh, Didier looked as wacky as I did. I thought Jacques mm -hmm. must like people like that. Didier stood outside in the rain while Jacques told him why he was going to cancel his appointment. Oh, no. I went, well, it couldn't have been the luck. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the Nebbiolo, though, I mean, it's... It, um, you know, Jancis was uh, in California er, at the earlier this year and um, a comment she made about some of other Nebbiolos in California, she said, well, you know, they're nice wines, but they don't taste like Nebbiolo. But the thing about your Clendenin family Nebbiolo, it does taste like Nebbiolo and it feels like Nebbiolo and it, and it, you know, cause the, uh, I, I totally get your comparison with Pinot. There's that lightness of foot with ample, but with amplitude of presence at the same time, that well-respected, respectfully made Nebbiolo has that yours absolutely has. But it, at the same time has that, there's this incredible tension around the tannin because it's so fine grained, but still incredibly present. You know, and I was lucky enough several years ago to taste your Nebbiolos back to those multi vintage blends that you were talking about. And the thing that really struck me is again, the incredible ageability of those wines. And it, um, to be honest, that tasting really changed a lot for me around um, my perception of California wine and, and the potential of Italian varieties. I was already very curious, like really hunting around trying to find out, well, you know, what can we do? Because I, it seemed to me, California must be able to do something with Italian varieties, but I felt like it was, I was hard pressed to find the examples. And this is several years ago, but the um, getting to do a multi vintage vertical of Nebbiolo with you back to these multi vintage blends from the late eighties, early nineties. And, and, and some of many of those wines actually, you making Nebbiolo before you had the clonal selection you felt was right even. And then, and still they were beautiful and beautifully aged, you know, and now with these, with the um, planting that you have there, Bienacido kind of up on top there at Bienacido, you are working with the clonal material that, that you appreciate too. And it's just like this other level, you know? And so it's, I want to, like, I want people to know, take this wine seriously. This is such an example of what California can do and how there's still so much room for us to find out what California can do. You know, you said at the beginning, California is still developing its wine culture. And, you know, something I appreciate so much about you is again, you have this, have had this long-term vision from the beginning. You've really stuck to your guns on making the wine you know is right for you to make, even if it's not the popular wine at the time. But you've also been willing to explore and try new things and make Tokai Friolano from California, make Nebbiolo from California. You know, another wine of yours that's one of my favorite wines of California is your Hildegard, a white blend, which for a very long time, white wines were not regarded or as interesting or serious at all. And here you're making this incredibly gorgeous, serious white blend, you know, from, from a host of uh, 
varieties. And, and so I just want to really say, you know, I have so much respect for this Nebbiolo, but in my mind, it's an illustration of so many other things that I respect about you and the work that you do. So thank you for that. Thank you, Elaine. Are we going to take a little break now or what's... Yes. Yeah, so it, so we have filled the hour and I, um, I really want to thank everybody for, for being here. You're getting um, a lot of messages, people asking, please send wine to this country too. <laughs> you know, <laughs> one of the, one of the last things I want to mention though, that I think you deserve a lot of credit for as well is, you know, we talked about how you've really helped build a community of winemakers there in Santa Barbara County. But the other thing you've done from the very beginning is really, you know, like you said, you have, um, you have, a, you have a good export presence. And the thing that people don't realize is you have that all around the world. One of the funniest stories I w was told that referenced you, and unfortunately I can't recall who it was, but I had a winemaker several years ago say they were so excited because they were going to do a tour across d different countries in Asia. And they, were, they really believed they were going to be the first California winemaker to bring their wines to some of these new markets. And in the middle of this trip, they got to Vietnam and they're in the middle of nowhere in Vietnam and they sat down to this like super local, really rustic restaurant. And the server came and gave them a wine list and there was Aubon Clement. <laughs> you know? and that, we probably had to work hard for him. I, I'm going to step away for a second. Yeah. Because uh, one of the difficulties of becoming an old, experienced well, winemaker is, is the bladder. And well, I'll, I'll be right back. We're time to be done anyway. So let's go ahead and sign off. And thank you so much for your time, Jim. We really, we all appreciate this time with you. Thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. Thank you from around the world. Thank, thank you. you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. And I uh, just want to say thank you to all our attendees. Um, a recording of today's webinar will be published to the California Wine Institute's YouTube channel in the next couple of days. And all participants will receive an email with the link. And we also hope that you will join us next week as we continue this chapter of Behind the Wines. Uh, we'll speak with Ted Lemon, the biodynamic producer of Literai Wines in West Sonoma County, and that will take place on Tuesday, August 11th at 10 a.m. Pacific.